participants, it's a very great honor to be with you today. And first of all, I would like to give you a gift, a special gift for you. Um, this gift comes from somebody whose name is Paul, like you. So it's a special gift. I give it. May I? I'll keep it special. Without but you have to open it. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> no. No. It has. No. <laughs> From Paul, you know, and uh, it is an association which name is uh, Amayo pour la vie, and all uh, athletes give their uh, T-shirt yes. that they wear and they sign specially for this. Uh, <laughs> This association, uh, so the, 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 the sportif gi gives their... give him my thanks. Yeah, <laughs> if you want, yes, of course. And uh, it is for kids that are ill and in hospital. And uh, these uh, athletes don't uh, give their T-shirt to be sold for this association and to help uh, kids that are um, in difficulty. So they were very, very proud to offer you this gift and uh, Paul too. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this discussion with Mr. President Paul Kagame. And uh, to begin the discussion, I would like to say a few, few words. Don't worry, very few words about you. Paul Kagame, the youngest of a Tutsi family of six children, was born in 1957 in Rwanda, also called the land of a thousand hills. Marvelous name. At that time, the Belgians were in charge of the country ruled by the Tutsi monarchy. And two years <laughs> later, the Belgians started a new alliance with Tutsi rivals, rivals the Hutus, who would later lead the social revolution. And in, in, it is in this climate of fear and violence that Paul, yourself, four years old, was forced to leave his home and take refuge in Uganda. Thus began a difficult exil, exile in Uganda because you were a child different for, from the other ones as you came from Rwanda. And it is in this environment that you shaped your character and turned your feeling of injustice into a political struggle against the Yutu regime in Kigali. Paul Kagame gave up his dream of becoming an airline pilot and led the foundations of the Rwandan Patriotic Front with his comrades. The next steps and well, are well known. In the midst of the genocide, this charismatic leader, supported by Uganda forces, took power in Kigali in July 1994. He was elected president of the Republic six years later, later in 2000. Reelected twice, Paul Kagame was able to carry out his visionary project on the economic and social fronts. An average annual growth of 7.5% percentage over the past 20 years symbolizes the dynamism of this country, which is now a model of development in Africa. And combining innovation and tradition, Paul Kagame has managed to reconcile the country while projecting into the future with ambitious and groundbreaking projects, such as the innovation city in Kigali, a true African Silicon Valley. As a conclusion, Mr. President, I would like to use your own words. As we can grasp all the energy, design, and ambition that guides your innovative projects from, for the digital and human transformation of Rwanda and on a wider scale Africa, you said, you said, Mr. President, what I am looking for is modern Afri Africanization. I am an African that relates well and meaningfully 
to the rest of the world. I am not an African lost in the jungle looking for magnanimous people to give me a sense of direction. Who said that two, two days ago? I, it seemed. It, so, Mr. President, to begin the, the discussion with you and all our colleagues, I would like to ask you the first question. In 1918, you have been nominated twice by two prestigious organizations, a man of the year. What is your secret? Well, let me, I'll come to, to, to answer the question. And um, David and Joel, first of all, thank you for um, very kind, uh, welcoming remarks, and uh, I thank uh, YPO, um, Paris, France chapter for inviting me, uh, and I had no hesitation accepting the invitation, uh, even though the plan for being here was completely on a different basis, and. Uh, that I have been handling since morning until a few minutes ago. Uh, but I, was, I, I wanted to thank you and uh, inform you that uh, I'm happy to be part of you and uh, for now to be with you for this discussion. The second aspect, now maybe I can uh, answer the, the question. Um, I cannot give all the answers for my and my country's uh, uh, successes or failures, but I can uh, describe uh, what drives us and <coughs> maybe it is what uh, makes us achieve some of the things we set out to achieve. One is with the history you have um, already described, and which applies, by the way, to many Rwandans. Um, who subsequently led to, this led us to be involved in the struggle. Uh, being involved in the struggle wasn't by accident. Uh, neither was it uh, uh, just an adventure people undertook to uh, do certain things anyhow. It, it was deliberate, it was uh, out of commitment, it was out of understanding uh, that people can do things for themselves, Always friends, well wishers will be welcomed and they are very helpful. But it has to start with people themselves. So that was the understanding goes well. When I was a refugee, for all the decades I was, in living uh, almost on handouts in the refugee camps. Um, uh, first of all, the understanding was this was the wrong place for me. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a wrong place for anybody. <laughs> and uh, therefore the understanding was no, but somebody or people can challenge this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because one asks themselves, why would others be okay? Uh, and it, they are okay for what they are able to do for themselves. So why would I not be okay? Uh, try 
trying to do some things for myself. Or I, when I, I'm talking about me, it's not me. I'm just I'm using it just to describe all those who were with me or who I have been part of uh, to, for this, to be able to do this. Uh, and this is even go, goes beyond that. It's, even if you are just to narrow it, say, to Rwanda or Africa and the rest of the world, let's say Europe, America, other developed uh, societies. For me personally, my question has been all of us being human beings that we are, why should some of us be where they are and for us we are not where we should be? It's not because anybody is more special than the other. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that there are people in this world who are more special than others. And deep in me, I thought it is something that needs to be challenged, first of all, as, as even a thinking itself. But you just don't, don't challenge it by saying, no, I don't agree. That is only the starting point. You challenge it, more importantly, by building on that belief and doing something that actually will demonstrate it. So that's when, when I, we were growing up uh, in refugee camp. And uh, I remember when I was 12 years old in primary school, I asked my father, who passed away three years later, why we were where we were. I asked, I asked my father, I said, why are we here? Why are we refugees? Why are we stateless? Why are we having to live on handouts? I said, what, what crime did we commit? So my father took me a long history explaining the injustices and all kinds of things that happened that saw people flee the country in the region and, and beyond. So, but that stayed with me as I was growing up. And uh, I was lucky to be part of a group that later on was to emerge to do what we did to find our country and our rights later on. I first uh, uh, got involved in the liberation struggle in Uganda, actually, for five years. We fought all in Uganda for five years. We were part of the liberation Uganda from 81 uh, to 86. So I served in the army in uh, uh, Uganda. In 1990, the, I'm saying this because it brings something that may explain to you. So I, I, I was sent for a, a military course as an army officer already in Uganda, and I'm after the liberation of Uganda. So I went to the United States to attend the military course. And then when I was there, halfway through the course, uh, that's when uh, the liberation of Rwanda started in 1990. But I was part of uh, that organization before I went for the course. And when I saw so, but I had told the people we are with that they should start, I can't refuse to go for the course on which I'm sent by the Ugandan government. If I refuse, they have the right to send me to prison for refusing to obey the orders. So when they started, I came back and joined them. <laughs> 
But I didn't go back to Uganda, I went straight to Rwanda where the war had started. But I remember when I went to explain to the commandant of the military college that I was actually leaving the course and tried even to explain why I was going to do that. Uh, the commandant was just looking at me as if something had gone wrong with me. And he thought I was crazy, he just couldn't understand. Because at that time I'm putting on a military uniform and the badge is a Ugandan badge because I was there as a Ugandan officer. Then I'm telling him how I'm going to fight a war in Rwanda. And I'm trying to tell him how I grew up as a refugee and da da da, da how he came to be there. How he, da, da, da. The guy couldn't understand what I was talking about. But anyway, to cut the story short, I, I, in the end I told him, I said, whether he understands it or not, I'm going. So that is, uh, <laughs> that's how he left the college and he went and he became part of the struggle. Now, these things don't, uh, therefore I'm trying to say, they don't happen by accident. It's like you, you have a personal mission and there are so many like you, you come together and you form something. So after that, still, uh, that's personal to me and I'm sure to many others. You don't sacrifice yourself, you don't base on these convictions and ideals to do something like that and then when it comes to you, you start wasting the opportunity. So the, the, when, the, when you have identified the opportunity, you go for it. And uh, if it means a fight for it, it means a sacrifice for it, it means... So when we go to our country, uh, therefore, uh, and I just, I can say, uh, while I planned to be part of the struggle and was happy to be, uh, I, it never occurred to me that I would hold different positions or even later on, it couldn't occur to me that I would ever be president because that never even came to my mind. I was just driven completely differently from a different thing. So, and now, being a president or being any leader in that situation, for me, I considered it as uh, an opportunity to do and contribute to something that gives me satisfaction that I'm maybe on the path to where I should be. And, and I also thought this was going to, it also comes to my mind that not only for me personally to be on the path where I should be, but even many others like me are also on the path to being where we should be, meaning therefore the whole country. So there is a sense of that behind whatever we are doing in our country with all the challenges uh, our country has. It's a small country, it's in the middle of the most complicated uh, uh, part of the world, uh, challenging neighborhood and uh, having to develop an economy from scratch, trying to create something for ourselves, it's evident, and then of course, trying to build a country that uh, has been torn apart and destroyed completely by the, the tragedy we had in 1990. We had many other tragedies, being poor country and so on is bad enough. Then it was followed by far worse things where we lose one million people. So. I, I don't mean that uh, somebody has to do right or do right things because they have suffered some tragedies or injustices or anything. No, somebody's supposed to be right naturally or, or do things that are right. But when you have been uh, pressed and pressured by problems, 
there are two people who emerge. One is the one who gets crushed by this tragedy and uh, the pressures and gives up. That's one possibility, and maybe to con it happens to many, actually more than the second part, which I wanted to say is these pressures of life can form you into something that is going to stand the test of time. And, and you therefore, so in, in our situation, we have had those two things. We have had people who gave up and got crushed by the pressures of time. And we have also had some who stood up and said, we'll give it a fight until we get what we want. So I chose to be on that one, on that side. Thank you very much. So you are a man of conventions. I, I went to Rwanda last year, and I discovered your population and all your uh, challenges and uh, you face, and the way to face it, uh, them. So you are, uh, many people are involved in Rwanda in uh, activities and uh, probably want to ask you the first question. May Jacques uh, ask the first question because it's most difficult to ask the first one. <laughs> uh, no, okay, so first of all, uh, you know that my name is Enchuti because I am a Huande. Yeah. I have the nationality. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, c'est facile, uh, bravo. Yeah. Institute and one now a project in China. And why in Kigali? First of all, because we had the visit of uh, uh, the ambassador. You know, you have two ambassadors in France the real one, uh, Jacques Capane, and the Maresco family. <laughs> and they, they met me, they came in Strasbourg with uh, Diane, the Ministry of Health. And it was uh, for me an exceptional, it was an exceptional uh, meeting for me. They convinced me to go and to visit uh, Kigali, to have a meeting with you, and I think the first day we have accepted to do that in Africa. Why? First of all, because we read, I didn't know you really precisely before, but I read a lot of books. Uh, one is uh, Paul Kagame, The De Gaulle of Africa. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very nice, and I, I like De Gaulle, so that is the reason why. <laughs> And uh, when we discuss together, when you discuss with your uh, co-workers, I've seen that really the fact that you arrive in Kigali, it was my first trip in Africa, everything is so clean. Mm -hmm. Everybody says that it is the only country you have no corruption. Mm -hmm. And the young generation, you have to be proud of your young generation. We have accepted to do that, to give uh, an hour of land of uh, 10 hectares, not only for the education system, but to attract, to create startup. It is, we don't do that by charity. It is really an investment. For you, your university in Kigali, which is a CM University of uh, Artificial Intelligence, it's a subsidiary of Pittsburgh. I said uh, last year, my three uh, directors of research, they have recruited five engineers for artificial intelligence. They came back last week, they have recruited seven. The level of your engineers after the school, it's a top level. They, they want to, to stay in your country. They work, there was one month in, in France. They work from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and after that until midnight. Oh, each of them, they have a godfather. They have three video conference per week to see how they do the work. When they have a work to do in one month, it's done in 10, in 10 days, and it is perfect. 
So what we decide is to create, I think, the most important uh, team of artificial intelligence dedicated to minimal invasive surgery in the world by France, by Rwanda, Taiwan, and China together. So we will have, I think, in the next three years, a team of 200 engineers only dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. So we are not to say in France, first of all, because here I am around this. I want to say that for me it was an exceptional opportunity to have this visit in your country. And I really to thank your ambassador and Diane, the Minister of Health, because for me it was a fantastic discovery. I just want to finish to say how the young generation admire what you do, your vision about new technology. You are really the high standard chief of state. So thank you very much. Pauline wanted absolutely to ask you the second part. Mr. President, <coughs> dear friends, um, I'm Pauline Duval. Um, I'm here with my husband today. Uh, we are um, a French uh, private business company in real estate and tourism around all around France and in uh, Africa. We uh, have 4,000 employees. And I actually came uh, to uh, Kigali uh, for the second time um, two months ago for the CEO forum. Um, with my partner Vicky, we walked around all around Kigali and thank you uh, for saying all this uh, amazing stuff about Kigali because it's actually real. It's um, really clean, everybody's like uh, enjoying uh, the city, we can see that and we can see that there are a lot of professionals. And um, we're looking uh, with the Rwanda Development Board um, on a project next to the conference center and on other projects as well, like microfinance in your country and a lot of real estate projects. And I just wanted to know uh, how you were feeling about French investment in your country. Well, the feeling is that uh, we, we don't have Enough, or anywhere near to enough of the French investments in Rwanda. So I, I definitely want to use this opportunity to appeal to the French uh, investors, or companies, to come and do something in Rwanda. But I understand why. Uh, also, uh, I think it comes from the history. The past is such that. Uh, what has happened has always tended to displace the two countries uh, from each other. Uh, and, and what we have decided ourselves in Rwanda, uh, and uh, I can see things changing here in France as well. Uh, we, we, we have been trying to be very pragmatic realistic in our politics where we bring things. We we don't want to get lost in our past. We want to focus on the future. Mm -hmm. We tend to keep trying to you know finding ways of moving forward and not to so we tried that for a long time but we can't do it alone. We have to be having both sides trying to do that. But I see today an opportunity uh, in the recent, uh, well, in this administration. Uh, it's not to me, for me to judge politics of countries or judge countries, but I, I can only say what I experience from my side, and that is I see today an opportunity to, for France and Rwanda to get closer, to work together. Uh, whatever problems of the past, we can keep handling them on the side, <laughs> and then keep going forward. <laughs> this is this what is. So I, I'm just uh, hopeful that more French companies can keep coming. 
uh, to Rwanda and uh, our own people in, in Rwanda coming to France to do whatever they want to do uh, that benefits them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So you're a positive man and you see always the future. Okay. Bruno wanted to ask you the third question. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Bruno Brig. I run a manufacturing group in France, manufacturing machinery. Uh, two families welding and cutting in one side and battery charger on the other side. We supply products throughout Africa and in EAC in particular. I wanted to know from you what's your vision of EAC and if you could speak about currency also. Uh, sometimes my clients in EAC they have difficulty and want one in particular to get some euros. Could we talk about uh, what's your feeling about integration of the currency? Do you think it will be done in EAC? And what's the vision of EAC as a group of countries so that it is easier to trade with your own or with China or with US? The, we have been trying uh, to have uh, uh, integration happen in the East African region, but it is across Africa. Africa, we want Africa uh, to integrate. But to integrate 55 countries all of a sudden and it happens is very difficult. So again, being realistic leads us to saying, why don't we create sub-regions come together, when the sub-regions have come together and they are fine, then you can bring the sub-regions to the continental level uh, for integration. Integration is, is, for obvious reasons, the first one being, uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, the whole continent of Africa, the 55 countries, where well, some are much bigger than others, mine is, uh, one of those small ones. But in the end, every country, even those that think they are big, they are actually smaller, or well, first of all, they are small, and they are smaller than if they were part of a big integrated entity. So everyone benefits the size of everything increases with integration for everybody. So that is the, the most important thing. So we have an integration going on in the East African region, which is Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, the South Sudan, and Rwanda. Uh, the population goes up to probably 150 million people. That's a, that's, that's a sizable thing. I can say this is big now. Um, we have four levels of integration which we have attempted and two are already working, the other two are in the process. One is uh, the customs union that is working, is common market, it is working like 60-70%. Then there is the common currency discussing the central banks of that region are discussing how we can achieve integrating our, our currency in the region. The fourth is the political federation whereby we may even eventually if things were to work well have the whole region almost operating like one country. So the first two I mentioned are, are working to a great extent and then the rest uh, work in progress. So for those who uh, have interest in one country or another, uh, that, is, that is important. In fact, right, right, right now we have some things that work effectively, like uh, when for tourism, when you have uh, one visa of one country, you can go to other countries. We have one common visa operating now. Uh, you don't have to go to Kenya, an embassy, and apply for a visa, then you go to Tanzania, apply for a visa, then Uganda, Uganda, each, you, know, you apply for one, and then you have access to the market. Uh, and then you have also uh, 
are now instituted, the, the citizens of the countries can easily move uh, with the identity card. Just use the identity card, and then you, move. you don't need a visa, you don't need a passport, and use just ID. And uh, some of these things are already working and you want to continue. So that is the essence of the integration. Monsieur le Président, je suis euh, un avocat français et j'ai eu euh, une euh, courte euh, expérience euh, gouvernementale dans le gouvernement de Jacques Chirac. Mr. Uh, President, I've had um, a small experience in, uh, in uh, governance in government level on President Chirac. Et durant toute ma carrière d'avocat, que je suis toujours, j'ai la moitié de moi qui s'occupe du business et l'autre des droits de l'homme. Et je milite depuis toujours pour un rapprochement entre la France et le Rwanda. As a lawyer by training and by a, as a profession, I've had half of me um, looks at law as a business, and the other half looks at uh, human rights. And in that context, I've always been advocating for uh, Rwanda. Vous avez fait l'honneur il y a quelques années de euh, me proposer une rencontre à Londres, et nous avons beaucoup évoqué les difficultés diplomatiques entre la France et le Rwanda. Et après deux heures d'échange, nous nous sommes dit que j'allais revenir en France pour proposer des coopérations économiques afin de passer au-dessus ou de contourner les difficultés diplomatiques. Um, some years ago, you made me the honor of meeting me in London. And um, we discussed the difficult relations back then between France and Rwanda. And we, after a um, conversation, we agreed that I would come back to uh, France and Seek partners, engage people to find solutions to the issue. Et le président de la République de l'époque était parfaitement d'accord. Il m'avait donné sa bénédiction. And the then president of France, who agreed with me, was absolutely on board that president. Et avec votre ambassadeur, nous avons travaillé au mieux, mais sans succès. And, Lors, ouais. and, and with the ambassador, we tried our best. We did all the good things. Without much success. Mais bien entendu, nous n'avons jamais renoncé. Et lorsque le ministre de l'économie, Emmanuel Macron, était en campagne électorale, il m'a souvent emmené avec lui dans des voyages divers. Bon. Et notamment, je me souviens d'un voyage que nous avons fait en Algérie. Et dans l'avion, je lui disais, tu vois, la meilleure chose que tu pourrais faire dans ta campagne, pour montrer que tu vas être un grand défenseur des droits de l'homme, c'est de faire un petit tour par le Rwanda. And um, as I was working with the ambassador, we never gave up. Um, so when the then minister of economy, uh, Macron, then minister, um, traveled with me, he used to take me, uh, take me with him, and we were traveling to Algeria. And during one of the flights to Algeria, I told him uh, that one of the best things, one of the best signals. Nous avons manqué de temps, juste, bon, c'est très important parce que je pense que le président ne le sait pas. Nous avons manqué de temps pour vous faire cette proposition. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle nous avons aujourd'hui en France un président de la République qui a une volonté très ferme et très forte de définitivement organiser des rencontres sous les meilleurs auspices entre la France et le Rwanda. Mais déjà avant, il était très impliqué. Et je crois qu'il a pris des engagements de l'époque encore plus forts maintenant. Je voulais pouvoir vous le dire parce que nous savons qu'aujourd'hui les choses sont déjà sur la bonne voie, notamment avec Louise que nous avons rencontré aussi, mais tout va aller pour le mieux, sous peu, je pense. Monsieur le Président, nous n'avons jamais trouvé le temps de faire cette proposition, de proposer à vous, 
but I feel it's important that I give you this background because I believe it's part of the reason why uh, we have now have a president who is so determined, who has a strong will to create as many opportunities as he can to get Rwanda and France together. So I feel like it was important that um, I give you this background, which I've discussed with many people, including with the Mr. Lee. Pardon, I've aussi long, but I wanted to say <laughs> Sorry for having taken so much time, but I really wanted to say this. No, no problem. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, Nicole didn't want to speak, <laughs> but uh, she had finally a message for you. So, a great message. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Uh, you have a lot of fans uh, around this table, President. And uh, one fan is a woman whose name is Angela. And Angela, ask your question, please. Your yes. Excellency, I'm part of the Monaco, Israel, and Rwanda chapter of YPO. And as you know, we've been in Rwanda uh, doing things with YPO, with Emory, and, and with our company for a long time. And initially, it started with a YPO event where you said you had a problem with energy, and we worked on Ignite and, and provide a solution to that, and on irrigation with Gaviro uh, to bring, like, you know, like, top like new age technology for irrigation in the country. And I think one of the things that characterize your leadership, in my opinion, is that you have a vision for a nation. You have roadmaps in the different industries on how to look at this vision, how to deliver on, the, on them using the latest technology, the latest innovation. And more than anything else, you have the amazing ability to really push execution and do it in a way with like a great government to do that. And what I wanted to do to ask you, probably after Viva Tech and everything around technology innovation, and, and we have the innovation fund that we're pushing through IPO and beyond to invest in technology out of Rwanda for Africa and for sustainable development, is, is what next? What are the top two or three really roadmaps, private sector led, that you want to push and encourage like all of us here to invest our time and you know our, our brain and our effort and capital? to go and push for the country and for, 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 for pushing these visions that you have. Thank you. Well, there isn't a, a single thing, but we can combine things together. You know, what we have had in, uh, we have created the vision, it's called 2020, from 2000 to 2020. It was basically starting with investment in human capital. Our people, our people are the main asset we have, uh, and that's where we spend most of our money and time, uh, developing this young talent, you know, so that we, in the future, create uh, a knowledge economy, uh, which has a chance. Rwanda has many constraints, one of them which you maybe you haven't talked about, is that we are a landlocked country. It's a country in the heart of, to have access to the sea, we go through Uganda, Kenya, or through Tanzania, to Dar es Salaam. So when you are landlocked, it means a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> we have to find ways also to navigate around these problems. One of them is, uh, to invest in certain sectors. That's how we have concentrated on services sector. And that's how we have concentrated on educating our people and uh, increase the use of technology, all these things, and then which would lead to, if we are producing anything, they must be high value products. Because if they are not, then being landlocked really creates serious problems for you. But high value goods and products will lessen the, the, the costs of being uh, landlocked. So we, we therefore invest in those things that will increase, continue to increase uh, our capacity, knowledge, skills, advanced skills, and uh, high value products that you can put on the market. But it all starts with our people. So anything that, uh, but there are many things, that's why I'm saying they are more or less interlocked. You see, when we are talking about technologies, when we're talking about uh, information and techno communications technologies, 
You don't do that uh, successfully if you're not investing in energy, for example, because the electricity becomes almost a lifeline for everything you're trying to do. So we invest in energy, we invest in technology, we invest in our people, and so on and so forth. And, and we don't leave anything behind, for example, um, again, like agriculture. Agriculture means if you do it well, you are able to feed yourself, uh, and that is a, a, a big solution to many things we stand for. But we need to get involved in, uh, in modern agriculture. There was mention of uh, you know, technologies of irrigation, the different inputs that go into agriculture, and then we are able to produce things. We have also concentrated on adding value to many things we, we, we produce. It's like traditionally, you, all of us around the table know it. We, in, in Africa, there might be, say, mining companies around here. But in Africa, mining is such that it benefits more those who invest in the min, mine, mining more than the countries where the minerals are found. <laughs> so this is a, you, you are rich with the minerals, but exploiting it tends to make you poorer than me. <laughs> so I think we need to change that kind of narrative. Well, there are countries that got it like uh, uh, right. One of them that I know basically is a country like Botswana, and uh, there are not many. The rest. Uh, Mining just creates the... But for us, for example, what I wanted to come to, I, I meant was, we should work with those who are interested, or uh, like minds, therefore, to make sure we add value in our countries. You can see how far we are coming from, uh, like in, Af in Africa. Let's say we produce coffee in Rwanda, right? The best coffee you can have anywhere in the world. <laughs> But we pick the beans, we dry them, we send them somewhere, thousands of miles away. They prepare the beans and turn them into your coffee packet and then bring it back to us and <laughs> <laughs> we pay 10 times what. <laughs> I mean, this goes against, again, where we started the story when you asked me the most complicated question. Why should I be the one who will grow coffee, send it 10,000 kilometers away, then be served coffee when it comes back or that distance? It just doesn't make sense. So why don't I prepare coffee? And if I were to export it, I export it with value added. So that's what we are trying to do even if to our minerals. We have partners from Europe would work with us, and we add value, and then the rest is history. I have to say, like for those, many of people know Rwanda here, but for those who don't, is you might be landlocked, but the reason why we chose to come to Rwanda and to make it our headquarters for Pan African activities that we have today, and for the fund which invests regionally, is because it's an amazing hub. So it might be landlocked, but it's an amazing hub to have a general Africa-related and even Dubai, Middle East, etc. strategy uh, because of the institutions, because of the government, uh, ease of doing business, people that you work with, and Except safety yeah. and everything else around it. And that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, President. Mr. President, um, you, you plan uh, Smart Africa across uh, all the continent, and you distribute a kind of homeworks from everybody. And uh, can you tell us more about what you mean about a modern Afri Africanization? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Um, you see, as I said earlier, we try to ask ourselves, what's, what's 
what's the problem with Africa? If you look at back, you find 30 years ago, some economies in our country, in our continent, 30, 40, some economies were as at the same level with, say, Korea, right? South Korea. Mm -hmm. Other countries you can talk about, Malaysia, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. it, I, I'm not talking about the most advanced economies. <laughs> then, over 30 years, over 40 years, the economies of Africa are still where they were, or they are even, they go to us. So what is the problem? <laughs> And that's the problem I have with uh, some of the development partners. Mm. Now we can talk about Europe and others. Partly they have kept us there because they are okay with giving us a few things and it's like, uh, because I have been asking them directly in the discussions around the table like this, I said, if you give me money for development, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and can't you see that I'm not making any improvement or progress? If you see that I'm not making progress, why do you keep giving me the same thing all the time? <laughs> Yeah, there must be. You, you, you have to change something. Else. Okay, but otherwise, it's absolutely nuts. You can, I mean, you can't keep saying, no, 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 keep quiet. Development money. So that's why we, we, we decided at some point, and we have been mobilizing even other Africans. It's like, what? Well, official development assistance isn't working properly. Let's concentrate on private sector development. That might, we have a chance with that. Second, we also tell the development partners that because they have come to us, they complain about China. China, what are you with China? You know, China is bad. They're exploiting you. They're doing this, and and the only answer to them is look. We started with you. China has come in and is actually aging you out. Why? Because China, whatever wrongs they are doing, they are putting their money directly on something that the Africans want. If you're going to build a road for me, oh, of course, then you got me in my weakness because I needed the road. If you're going to build a bridge for me, I needed the bridge. So even if you come and give me the bridge and later on you do something funny, at least I have the bridge. <laughs> 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 then you can <laughs> keep <laughs> So, and these conversations have, have, have to get us to a point where we understand each other. But it's not just that. Uh, I, I can't blame other people for our own problems. I think the biggest chunk, the part of the problem is ourselves. Because you ask, uh, we ask ourselves, the Africans, and the Africans, I said, you know, for somebody to come and do something wrong with you, it's because there is something wrong with you. Yes, otherwise you should be able to either refuse something or accept something. So what do you refuse and on what basis? And what do you accept and on what basis? We should be able to retain that kind of position uh, and, and act on our behalf. So for me, when I'm talking about uh, modern uh, Africa, I'm talking about the Africa that stands up for itself and insist, like we are sitting at the table here, mm. 
we, we are sitting as, as partners, as equals, as colleagues, as, you know, there is an exchange of views. Mm -hmm. So we must put ourselves, by, even by force, around the table. Yes, and be part on that table. You can't have people here deciding for Africa when the Africa is absent. Mm. Why? Why should the people sit around the table like this and decide what happens in Africa or what doesn't happen when actual Africa is not on the, around the table? We must come and demand and say, no, it must be at this table. It must hear and contribute and say something. That's, that's a new Africa that... Uh, Yes. Perfect, President. I knew that it was a very good question, and I knew that uh, it's a very important point for you. Yes, and for, absolutely And important. everybody must know that, because I went, I was in Kigali, and I noticed that from you. So thank you very much for, for this um, answer that is very uh, precise. Is everybody want to ask a question? Yes. Hi, Mr. President. My name is Pierre Debac. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Open Classrooms, which is an online education platform that trains 3 million people a month on tomorrow's jobs, mainly on tech jobs, digital jobs. Uh, we train uh, a quarter of the 3 million students a month in Africa. Um, we ran early, earlier this year a program to train 500 developers in Rwanda. Um, my question is related to education and uh, making Rwanda the digital hub, obviously. Um, what is your strategy when it comes to higher education and, and lifelong learning? How do you plan to build um, the digital stronghold uh, in Rwanda when it comes to um, making great talent on uh, digital jobs. With the education and uh, knowledge and uh, digital jobs, uh, there are a number of things one has to look at and they have to come together. One, we have to invest in the people that education you're talking about. So we have to develop institutions that allow them allow that will allow our people to learn the next question is what type of learning that people should have it's a learning that allows that creativity or innovation uh, and, and that culture to develop therefore that's how things have been changing it's no longer just the classroom kind of education that is uh, you know, formatted one way and a uh, child comes, studies. There, there is a lot of flexibility people are looking at. There have been many studies and many conversations about how education can change and uh, therefore uh, allow this flexibility of development of uh, creativity and innovation. So that, that is one. And of course, concentrate on certain uh, uh, areas like sciences, mathematics, and, and things like that as well in, in the education curriculum without eliminating other things. The third is you have to invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure, digital infrastructure, that therefore will enable uh, this, this talent that is developing to have uh, the kinds of availability of the tools and platforms that are necessary to, to do that part. The fourth is once somebody has been innovative, has been creative, has an idea that needs, you know, at the end of it, you don't just do that and that's an end in itself. You do it so that you have a solution or you have a product that goes on the market and not only deals with the problems, but feeds back to you for its benefit. 
So that, that whole ecosystem has to be created, and that's what we have actually been investing in, the higher education, the infrastructure that supports the, that supports the technology that we have want to see in place, then the financial institutions and the mechanisms that will allow people to tap into uh, that for doing what they want to do and turn things into products and solutions. So it's that pathway that forms, and it's always changing. It's not, uh, or it's never complete. It keeps uh, it's back and forth challenging uh, the environment and the situation as we go forward. Hey, Mr. President. I'm very um, happy to be here with you, and thanks to the invitation. Uh, I just come back from Kigalitas, and uh, I want to say that first, uh, uh, my company, uh, uh, Tactis, uh, it's an engineering and consulting group on digital infrastructure and sharing uh, telecommunication infrastructure. So we are very uh, interested by your project and your different uh, realization in, in uh, this way because it, it, it's foundation of digital transformation, like you said, uh, at this uh, uh, table. Uh, I, I am in very team in the group uh, for the you know, uh, transformation of Rwanda on your project, and I want to congratulate you for the project of uh, Smart Africa, uh, like uh, uh, you said before. Smart Africa is uh, uh, ambitious uh, uh, for Africa, uh, not only for Rwanda, and it's uh, now, uh, I think, 25 or 26 countries. Uh, so it's 26 country for this week. And uh, I'm very uh, proud to say that we just signed a, a memorandum of, of understanding with uh, Smart Africa for develop a digital observer for Africa for helping uh, uh, investor or uh, innovator in Africa to find information of uh, what, uh, what it exists already. Uh, in Africa, because there are many uh, innovation, many people who develop projects. It's crazy, like you know, a uh, uh, few years ago when uh, uh, the project of uh, drone uh, in your country start. You are the first of the world to to opening your uh, uh, sky to the drone. I, I want to thank you for that because uh, when uh, America. Uh, a closer sky on European closer sky. You said I want to open my sky to to develop innovation. I think uh, you are inspired by two men. I read something like that. De Gaulle, like uh, Miss uh, uh, Marisco said, and also I think Lee Kuan Yew, uh, <laughs> Singapore. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, not, it's an exact, but I, I, I read that. <laughs> Maybe you can say uh, uh, something about uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, so, uh, so I, I think it's like a, you know the first uh, step of Singapore when I was in, when I, I am in Kigali, I smelled something like that. So it's why I think you, you, this is the right place and the right moment to, to be in, in Rwanda. I just uh, opening a, a subsidiary with Bernard uh, uh, Wawo, my uh, uh, partner in in Rwanda, and uh, I start this project with Smart, uh, Smart Africa. And uh, I, I want to know if what is your first uh, objective, you know, for the uh, uh, one uh, uh, global uh, digital market? Uh, because we speak about of that, but it's not uh, it's it's a target. But how you can uh, uh, fix it? <laughs> how it's possible to, to, to obtain this, uh, uh, maybe, uh, 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 in few years, uh, this objective? Yeah, it's, it's a, first of all, it is a necessity. That's the starting point. But it is also difficult to achieve it with so many countries, with divergent interests and all kinds of things happening. But Nonetheless, you have to start by realizing that it is important, and then you keep like 
Smart Africa, we now, as we said, we have 26 countries. We should be having 55 countries, but you go with the three, then 10, then 12, then 20, so that's okay. It's a path. It's better than sitting back and doing nothing. We have to get going. And, um, but we can also see some of the other things happening. Like now we have created uh, um, uh, continental free trade area, which is becoming a reality now. Africa, for the, now 51, I think, have signed up to creating this one common market, which is going to be the biggest in the world, already is by what there is. And uh, those who have ratified for it to be in effect, it was supposed to be 22 countries, we have already achieved that. But we're achieving it because increasingly countries are realizing that it is beneficial to them. It's not just saying, oh, let's get together. And you no, know, they, they, they are now beginning to see that getting together is beneficial to them. Uh, only that some people realize it much faster than others, but still it's a pathway to that. Even with the Smart Africa, and uh, for example, we have to have standards. So digitization is one thing when we're talking about it, but we have to create standards. We have to create policies that are harmonized across the continent. It takes a bit of time. People really, even with integration, however much you explain the benefits, some people, some countries tend to remain alone. They want to, they think being integrated, you get lost in, the, then there is even false adherence to sovereignty and some notions that don't make sense when it comes to, they make sense if you are doing the right thing with them, but they don't make sense when you don't allow integration to happen that benefits you and you are using the issues of integration, uh, of sovereignty. Because with the sovereignty you have to uh, be careful. I mean, you, you, you can let go some of the things because of the benefits you want. So I, I think it's not a waste of time. We are already beginning to see really that, uh, for example, in the East African region, three countries, we have one uh, uh, common network, yes, which has eliminated uh, roaming charges. First of all, that has brought down, you know, it, it eliminated the uh, roaming charges, brought prices down by 50%, increased revenues by 20%, uh, uh, subscriber numbers shot up so many times. That means people are getting involved in, you know, and, and it is beneficial. So how, why would you refuse, therefore, to create a network for three countries or for five? Later on, you can have sub-regions, as I was talking about. Like West Africa can have one network, East Africa can have another network, Southern Africa can come together. Later on, we can have a continental if, if time comes. Mm. Mr. President, it was the last question, so um, at this time... Well, but if there are people who want to ask, we, we can... Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think we can be flexible with the time and... Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so that people have not traveled here from far for nothing. <laughs> okay. Yes. Another question. Mm. President, at this time we, we observe that um, you have many uh, dreams. Yes. And that's the reason why perhaps you are very busy. <laughs> because uh, yes. you are an entrepreneur. Yes. In fact, you are a president, but you are an entrepreneur. Yes. And, um, and, and uh, in the same time, you are a very concrete man mm. and very pragmatic man. Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, your team, your team. Yes. And uh, Surya, Surya is, uh, told me just a few minutes ago that it was very, she was very happy to follow you. Mm. 
everywhere, but it was very... Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, that, and I am young. <laughs> so she, she's training. I was, she's telling her, I was telling her she needs to be going to gym. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so, uh, yeah, so I think you have a lot of uh, um, progress to do in uh, gymnastic. And uh, uh, yes, I think so. So, President, you are a very charismatic man. And I understand why now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have understood, I think, some secrets. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for having given us your secrets. Mm -hmm. So, do you want, uh, does somebody to, does somebody want to, to, to ask a question? My friends, Pierre Badiot. Yeah. Ah. Thank you, Mr. President. So, um, I'm Ilya, I'm a former lawyer. Uh, as David says, uh, I was born in uh, Ranieri, uh, Musanze now, and I grew up in Goma, in the east of the uh, Republic of uh, Democratic Congo, so, Republic of Democratic Congo. My question is, what do you think, because we are very close, to, I spent all, half of my life between Giseni and Goma, and I would like to know what you think about the, the situation in the east of RBC. Just east or the whole of the other sea? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you east first and then you can talk about it. <laughs> because you are neighboring. So yes, maybe. Yeah. Because what happens, the progress or lack of it on the east and the other sea actually depends on what happens in Kinshasa as well. So that's why I was saying maybe the whole of it. But we are seeing a good progress. Uh, you know, sometimes when you are talking about other people's affairs, you want to be careful. I don't want to talk too much about Congo. It's not my country. It's my neighboring country. It's a country that I'm interested in. But for being neighbors and for the benefits that can come out of a country that affects you, whether by economy, by trade, by all kinds of things, you always want to wish them well, so, and, and even work with them to the extent that things can be good for you. So they went through elections recently. So many things happened. Now, we, in my mind, those things should be left behind us. And we look, we make the best out of what we have now. <laughs> so if we go, keep, we keep digging in the past, then you, you you create a situation that does not allow you to go forward. So where we are is, let's make the most and the best of what we have. And this is a conversation I had even with the president of Congo recently, Chisekedi, who is now the president. I forgot. It's like in my mind. I wasn't aware of the history, even the recent history of those elections. I concentrated on saying, what do we have now? What can we do about it so that we move to a better future? And uh, interestingly, the, he, the president I was talking to, he was, somebody mentioned you are, some people were the CEO of Forum. You know, he came there, he was there. And that's when I had a good conversation with him. He's very open-minded. He wants to work with, with Rwanda, with other neighbors, to eliminate security problems, and then do trade and do. So that is beginning. The fact that that is the mindset is good enough. The rest, but as you see, like in, in Kinshasa, they haven't created a government since the elections have been over. Of naturally, therefore, this is why I'm saying what happens in Kinshasa affects what happens in the East, because there are many things that are not going to be done in the East, because nothing happened in the West. Uh, so, but at least you can feel that they intend to do something they are trying to do things for themselves politically and manage whatever issues they have. And 
once they are through with that, the indication is that they want to work closely with neighbors, with all of us, to address security, economic, trade issues. And uh, I can't ask for more myself. So maybe you are shuttering between Goma and the parts of Rwanda in the north will be made easier, not only easier, but profitable. And uh, I remember your, your words, uh, build a build, uh, you know, bridge, not border. That you said in, in CEO forum to the President Chisikeli, and I want to say the, thank you for that, because, uh, you know, the, the French uh, author, uh, Saint-Exupéry, said uh, the future, not to foresee it, but to allow it. It's like you do. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. President, I would like uh, to ask your permission to invite my fellow uh, YPOers uh, to uh, Rwanda uh, as we are having uh, a very big uh, gathering next year. Uh, the whole continent will be gathered uh, and people interested by the continent and the YPO community will be gathered and, and uh, we will be pleased to have you all. He's also doing it on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Mr. President. And in fact, Excellency, the, the President has agreed uh, to, uh, to the Chairman of YPO that he will be there, so he is actually the one inviting you. Thank you. Merci. Yes, thank you for the challenging but uh, very kind moderation. <laughs> <laughs>